Cool. Um, I think we are ready to get going. Um, so uh, Kim is an electronic engineer um, who I think, like many engineers, has transitioned into kind of full-time software de development and who is currently doing DevOps work for South African Home Loans in Durban. And he is here, in fact, to tell us about uh, about DevOps and making things easier for your fellow developers. Um, so without further ado, uh, Kim, take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Simon. Um, I should just point out, you are correct. Yes, like most electronic engineers, I'm now doing software development. I did, however, spend 13 years of my career doing actual embedded type work. Um, so putting that, that the stuff I study to good use and then eventually have moved over to either the dark or the light side, depending on who you ask. So now full-time DevOps work, no hardware on my desk anymore. What, um, as Simon has said, what we're going to dive into today, I'm going to speak a little bit about some DevOps related aspects. If I can just move slides on. What is this about? Basically, what I have come across um, by nature of doing the work that I do for uh, my employer is that quite often everybody needs to write a script from time to time. Um, most of our company developers are C-sharp guys, um, but every, everybody needs to write a small tool every now and then. And when they do, our company, and I'm sure no one, everyone else is much the same, there's a certain set of infrastructure that exists that you want to work with. Um, and setting up to work with that infrastructure, particularly if you don't do it all the time, is time consuming. You have to look things up. You have to try and remember exactly how you got it to work last time. So it's difficult to get right. Six different people will do it six slightly different ways. They, so you know, the end result across the company's infrastructure will be slightly inconsistent. And if, for example, with my DevHaps or Dev hat, DevOps hat on, I introduce some new wonderful piece of technology, unless everybody knows it exists, the next time they go to write a script, they won't use it. They won't know it's there. So basically what kind of infrastructure I'm talking about is just an example of things like Docker. You know, we want our Docker files to be consistent. We want the images to work a certain way. Versioning standards, we want everything to be 1.0.0 rather than a.b.c.d. CICD type stuff, you know, auto building, we want it to work. We don't want people to kind of set things up and then have to come and, and ask questions about why doesn't it build, what are the problems, etc. And this may be slightly more applicable to us. I hope it applies to everybody. Um, the stuff that you set up and test in your staging area, how you get that into prod in a controlled manner is obviously also something you need to do. And if you're not doing it all the time, it's maybe not something that's that obvious. I should just point out, um, Simon did say in the start, I um, work for SA Home Loans in what is a very hot Durban, where I do a lot of this kind of work. There is, however, no SA Home Loans code in this presentation, I have been, in, I've taken inspiration from some of the stuff we do, but I've rewritten everything to be relevant to this talk, by which it's both in Python and much simpler than the stuff we'd actually use, because these are intended to be examples. Um, don't take any of the stuff I'm showing here and whack it straight into prod. Uh, you would be welcome to, it's not licensed or anything, but it won't work as well as you'd like. You, you will need to write a bit more than just the basic examples I've got here. There are lots of ways you can do this. I'm certainly not suggesting during this talk that what I'm going to present will be the best way to do it. It's just one of the many ways using some of the many tools. The tools I'm going to specifically be talking about are Cookie Cutter. Um, Cookie Cutter, if you've never heard of it, is much like Yeoman and other templating tools. You ask the user a couple of questions and you generate a set of files and directories and take some actions. That's the heart of what I'm talking about. Basically, if I sit down as a developer and I want to write a new tool, I can fire up my cookie cutter template and get pretty much a directory containing everything I need to make the script look like everyone else's script and work with the company's tools. In that case, we happen to be using Poetry. Um, in this, uh, PipEnv and the other tools are obviously all available as well. It's a, a virtual environment manager, if you've never heard of it, much like PipEnv. ETCD also comes into play. ETCD is a distributed key value store. Um, it can do very complicated things. You can cluster it and it can be magnificent. Uh, in this particular case, I'm just using it as basically a key value store that isn't on my hard drive. We use GitLab, which is, again, the tool I'm most familiar with. In this particular case, I'm using it to provide my continuous integration and my actual Git repository uh, storage. 
GitHub or your own local internal tooling, whatever you whatever you do it, all this is this, none of this stuff is applicable specifically to GitLab or to Poetry or to etc. And finally, in this talk, we use Harbor. Harbor is a tool that the VMware uh, Corporation provides. It's effectively a Docker registry that you can run yourself. I haven't. Uh, Yes, Casey, I can see your question. I wasn't necessarily going to see the questions, but I'm running with two screens. I will put the, uh, the slides will be made available. I'm fairly sure um, Neil was saying to me he'll ask for them on Saturday, but it's basically, it's a public GitLab group in my own GitLab. I will paste a link into this chat after I'm done talking or otherwise maybe in the Discord. We'll put a channel in there and I'll paste a link in there. Oh, unless you think that would be useful to do at this very moment. Um, moment through the magic of, well, it's not going to help. Oh, yeah, it turns out my link's broken anyhow. That's, that's not going to help at all. Oh, no, that is right. Sorry. Um, if my, my link isn't broken, I am. No, that can't be right. Okay, if that link's wrong, I'll paste the right link in the meantime. That doesn't look correct because it can't be. Uh, um, okay, sorry, I'm interrupting myself. That is correct. Everything I'm talking about is effectively in there. Okay, so I was the reason I said it can't be right is it's, it's a group of mine. I expected it to have my username attached somewhere, but okay. I'm slightly misremembering how GitLab does it. In this particular case, just in terms of the demo, just to note, um, I'm running all these things locally. I've got um, Docker images for GitLab, Harbor, etcd, um, uh, PyPI. All those things are running locally if you see them when we get to the demo. So to start, a cookie cutter template. You can rap rapidly set up a directory, um, which basically has everything in it that you need for in uh, the particular example I'm going to show, a Python project. Cookie Cutter is a Python-based project in its own right. It's not limited to providing templating for Python projects. Cookie Cutter can do whatever you like. Uh, my apologies if you heard that rather unique hardy darn noise in the background. That's the, the price of living in Devon. Cookie Cutter can do set up whatever you want. Um, I have two examples. I may or may not have the time to get to the second one, but it's doing bash. There's no Python involved in the second example at all. Cookie Cutter's job is basically to make you a directory and put some files into it and run some pre and post hooks that do a variety of useful things. So in this particular case, um, the example I'm going to show, we're going to make a base project directory with the subdirectories that a Python project would need um, in Poetry's kind of recommended format because Poetry is what we're using to do our uh, dependency management. A hook that will create and initialize a, Git, a new Git project uh, very stupidly so, there's no checking, there's no anything of the sort. Um, basically, if I am going to make a project called ABC, I'm going to get a new Git project called ABC. If there really is one, things will fall apart, which is why I've made sure that there isn't. It's going to configure poetry. Um, we're also deliberately using our own internal PyPI, because that's what lots of companies do do, to pull down, in one case, a package that is not available on the publicly available PyPI. Um, it's just a stupid daft little package I wrote to demonstrate how to get things from your own PyPI and etc. And then um, we'll give ourselves a basic Docker file, which I will show, configure some CI CD stuff through GitLab, and provide a custom Docker building tool, which you know, enough talking. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here, just to kind of kick us off, here is my local GitLab. Uh, this is the PyCon ZA project, uh, PyCon ZA group. There's nothing in it. That's all I wanted to show is that this is all starting from scratch. And if we come to my terminal here, uh, time for some copy pasting because nobody wants to watch me type, delete, type, repeat, etc. Basically, I fired a cookie cutter. Um, I have directed it to pull down a template from, uh, in this case, git.local, which is what I called my local git. You can also run it off files that are local to your hard drive. In this particular case, I've committed this project. It's the same project that's in the public GitLab. It's just here as well for more my convenience. 
So I fired it up. It's asked me if I run it before. Well, yes, because I did actually test this before I kind of leapt into the project. For the purposes of demo, I'm just going to write a very small, rather dwarf little Python script that is going to tell you about what images are in your local Docker registry. In this particular case, there's a couple of things that you need to know to make any project. Um, it, the, the system is going to need to know what is it called. In this case, I'm going to call it the DTR image reporter. I'm happy with the default version of 0.1. Just to note, this is a cookie cutter feature. Some things you have to provide. Some, some things can have a default. I had to provide project name. Hence, there's no square brackets after it. I can default to version. Again, it won't let me go on until I give it a description because I have to provide one. So let's just copy paste that too. The author is me. There's no checking on here. I could apply literally any string here, but um, I have decided that my company's cookie cutters should always be using Git, setting it up in the um, forefront. So I need to know what Git group to make a project in, which is the PyCon ZA group I showed you just now. And finally, a small amount of effectively Python if string manipulation going on here basically taking the project name and turning it into a slug suitable for directories and file names and so forth. So in this case, uh, dashes replaced with underscores. If I'd called the project name DTR underscore image underscore reporter, then um, that would be exactly the same. So I'm going to run that. And while it's going off to do its thing, you, if you're familiar with it all, you'll notice this is poetry uh, starting to do an install. I'm just going to quickly go back to the GitLab group and open up the new project, which now exists, DTR Image Reporter. If you're familiar with GitLab at all, or I mean, it's really not difficult to infer, there's now a, a repo in my Git, but it's empty. So this is GitLab's useful page to tell you how to actually get things into it. But that was just to show it does exist. Um, I did pick relatively very few Python packages, so it shouldn't take long to do the installing. Right, cookie cutter is done. Uh, I haven't told it to run in a verbose mode or anything, but it ran to success. If it didn't run to success, it would un basically unravel everything it did uh, to the extent that it could. Cookie cutter has effectively made a directory in here called DTR image reporter. If it doesn't run to success, you don't get the directory. Um, it, when I say to a certain degree, it can't unravel making the Git project, for example, because that's out of its hands, but it can unravel the stuff it can control. So just again, from a pretty simple example, we've called cookie cutter, we've told it a couple of uh, basic pieces of information, and it has given us a whole bunch of things. This is a project layout in kind of, as I point out, the, the format poetry would like you to use. So there are a couple of useful things in here. Here is a .git ignore file, um, which is in .git. So there's our git stuff in hand. The .git ignore contains, you know, Python-related projecty things. It's going to ignore the .vn. It's going to ignore um, egg uh, the egg directory, that kind of thing. GitLab CI, if you're not familiar with it at all, is basically how you tell GitLab to do the CI/CD work. Um, get to that a little bit later. Here's various. Here's a README, for example. If I look into the README. This is where cookie cutter's ability to use templates starts to come into place. This readme is effectively take the slug value and put in the description. So we've left with a, a useful readme file that at least matches what we told it when we made the project. If we look into the Docker file, um, Python 3 poetry is basically a, um, a, a Sorry, not Python anything. It's a Docker image which I have made before, which is also in that um, GitLab repo, which basically it's not very complicated. It takes a basic Python Docker container, installs poetry, configures poetry to not use a virtual environment, and then uses that poetry to build the project's pyproject.toml file and uses the resulting Python to run things. So. What we get here when we use it, we copy all the contents of DTR image reporter into slash app, and we build the container. It'll take this pyproject.toml file, put it into a Docker file. It's no deep major secret there, but the Docker file itself is in the repo if we want to have a look at it later. If I then look just out of interest into DTR image reporter, where you ended up with exactly one Python file. 
It doesn't help to LS it. And if I cat it, you'll find that this entire project does, at the moment, exactly nothing. Um, we've installed the description, we've installed uh, my name and an author and a description. But at the moment, we could build this and we could try and use it and so forth, but it really does absolutely nothing because there is no Python, um, there's no content to the Python file. And finally, the last thing we got out of our template is this uh, Docker build, which on my system is green because it's executable, and you'll notice is considerably bigger than anything else. Docker build is a tool I'll get onto speaking about next. It's basically something I wrote, which is again in that uh, GitLab repo. Its job is to do Docker creation in a company approved manner. It's another part of doing this kind of scaffolded work um, so that the Docker images you end up with look like the company's desired Docker images. They look like everyone else's. They work in the same way. They've got the same versioning, that kind of thing. The reason it's in here as an executable is just because for the purpose of this demo I was being rather lazy because everything is running on my laptop. It was easy enough to simply build an executable out of it and put it into the cookie cutter template. Obviously, in a real situation, you'd be a little bit more clever than that. Um, you'd make it available to each system that was using it in a somewhat smarter way than just dumping a, a binary into every template. But in that case, here we are, and it does work, which is what I was after. Just going to quickly squeeze back to the project and wait for it to reboot. And here we go. Here is the result of the directory. Um, part of Cookie Getter's job, once it built the directory and the templates and everything we wanted, was to push it into the Git project, which it has done. And so basically, this is the same set of files we've just looked at. If you are familiar with GitLab at all, one thing you'll note is I skipped uh, CICD building for this first step simply because the project doesn't do anything. There is no reason to do any CICD um, type work in here because there's literally nothing for it to do. I could build a container and it would do nothing. But let's change that. Let's demonstrate the rest of this kind of system and put in some actual code. That uh, DTR image reporter.py, which I mean, we could look at, it's not complicated. Is just some source I wrote earlier. Um, it's not a lot of Python, but here is the entire contents of DTR image reporter.py, which will form our new and magnificent tool. Poetry wise, we need a couple of things. And sorry, I'm suddenly reminded I didn't look into the Py project file. Let's just open that out quickly. The Py project file for a Python sense is where we used most of the questions that we asked up front. So here is the description, the author, the name of the project, uh, the version. And this particular case, I dictate as the Python owner of my fictional company that every Python project shall use at least Python 3.7. I want every project to have black. I want every project to have access to PT Python. In this particular case, I want to be using my local PyPI server, which as a side note is just a dev Py server. Um, hosting exactly one package. Just to kind of show what I mean, if I look at my devpy server, there is exactly one package in here, the argpars helper, which my uh, Python file tends to, does need. So I am going to just install those things. This, uh, whoops, there we go. So basically, I know that the new stuff I need needs Atters, Requests, and ArcPass Helper. Um, Atters and Requests, like installing anything else Python-wise, is going to go and get it from the third-party server. But um, ArcPass Helper isn't available in the third party. It's coming directly from my PyPI, which is unsecure because that's how I made it, basically. I haven't done anything security-related. This is all running locally on my hard drive, on my laptop. So. Just to kind of, and the reason I'm going is to show that with a little bit of setup, you can get a fully functioning script in a couple of steps. So if I do a poetry shell, um, we have spawned the .vn within my local directory because that was part of cookie cutter setup. And um, I'm of the school that your VNs live in the directories and I wrote the template, so we get it the way I want it. And if we go into DTR image reporter, we could execute the DTR image reporter. Um, here's the argpulse helper. It takes instructions and it does useful things. So if I just run it by itself, there is nothing in my staging directory on my uh, Docker registry. If I include 
stuff in prod. And again, I'm not expecting anyone to gasp and say what an amazing piece of software I've written here. It's really just to have something to use and demonstrate. So here it is running, and there are three Docker images in my prod directory. Right, I am quickly just going to push this into, uh, sorry, I've lost track of my set of notes. And before we move on, basically I'm going to go to my next slide because the two are connected. Another thing that is very useful if you use Docker at all, and uh, we do rather extensively at SA Home Loans and otherwise, is to be able to make sure that the Docker images you end up with have consistent behavior and consistent sets of labels and structure so that everything works with the rest of your tooling. So for example, in this example that I'm using, I want every Docker image to have exactly the same set of labels, as in I want to know, I want the same labels available on each image. I want them tagged in the same way. I want them to use the same kind of version information. And finally, and this is harder to get right than one would think, I want the images I build locally on my machine when I'm testing them to look and behave exactly like the images that end up being built by my CI CD tool. But by the same token, I don't want the images I built locally on my machine to end up elsewhere in the system. Um, basically, the way we've designed our system, and I'm pretty sure we're not alone in this, nothing built locally should end up running on one of our deployment machines, whether that's in prod or staging or one of our test environments. Because we have a CI CD system in place, everything we use should come from that. So basically, Docker build, which um, I could, sh uh, sorry, I've lost the track of which link I wanted. I didn't actually plan to open it up, and again, it is in the repo. This docker build.py is literally a small tool that I wrote, and this is what I was saying when I was pointing out that I've greatly simplified. There's very little error checking. There's very little smarts in here. Its job is basically to work with Docker and build the Docker file that it finds locally, and if it's running, by itself to generate um, an image on the local system it's running on, and if it's running in the CI CD system to generate one that then gets pushed into the Docker registry. I'm not gonna take a whole heap of time to go through this. My point's more to, to show that this kind of thing isn't difficult to do. See, there's 180 lines of Python in here. If you were a better Python developer than I was, you probably need fewer, um, and it's, it's really not massively complicated to do. What I am going to do is run it locally. Um, this dot docker build is exactly the same as I've just shown you source, just compiled into an executable. I'm just going to execute it on my system. There's a couple of things to note here, and I'll try to note them before they scroll off the screen. In terms of versioning, one of the major headaches along with a system like this is that if you have to write the version down in more than one place, almost inevitably, eventually, those versions will drift. So we've worked with systems before where, for example, the Python project's got a, a TOML file or a, a, a setup.py, which has a version defined. And then we go to Docker, and somebody else has to write down in there what that version should be. So now two different systems are tracking the version in two slightly different ways. That's not overly healthy, of course, because it means they'll drift. So one of the important things to do with a system like this, if at all possible, is to get your version from one place. In this case, Docker build is smart enough to look for a pyproject.toml file. It found one, so it's using the version. The reason I brought up etcd, and uh, ultimately, um, I don't know, time permitting, we'll get to it. If it isn't a toml file, the Docker build tool that um, we're talking about will then go looking to etcd and say, I'm trying to build project DTR image reporter. Do you have a version number for it? If you do, grab it, increment it, and store it back. If you don't, start from 0.1 and then store it. So the next time we run it, um, our project gets a higher number. I was getting slightly concerned because I was just watching it sit and do nothing, but it does appear to at least be building now. Um, this is the part where theoretically I should have prepared one earlier. Uh, I hadn't anticipated it taking very long to do the building. So I will just virtually twiddle my thumbs for a moment while we uh, sit and talk about it. But maybe while it does the building, I'm just going to skip around slightly. I hadn't quite planned to, to skip around at the talk, but I'm just going to go back to my slide while it does this building and just point out 
um, while it builds, and while I'll go back to show how it works in a moment. So the one other aspect of working in a uh, kind of controlled company type environment, we find it quite useful with our Docker images to only deploy into production images that have been what we call promoted, that's not an unusual term, into a production project. So literally the production deployment instructions will only permit you to get it from a particular project, but you can only get into that production project by using a promotion tool, which again, I've written a very simple example. So everything that our CI CD builds, and we're going to see it build in a moment, goes into the staging uh, project. If you want that to be deployed, Company policy will not permit you to deploy it from staging into production. You need to put it in, into the production project. And the reason this is useful, particularly for SA Home Loans, but for any other kind of firm in our uh, shoes, we are a financial institution, which means we are subject to rather extensive audit. There's probably auditors on site eight months out of the year, or at least there are in, in years prior, prior to this one. Um, this, this year, I suspect they're mainly working remotely. The auditors are quite prone to asking questions like, you know, who approved this? Why are you running this version? What, uh, where, where's the ticket trail that says that um, a manager said you should deploy this particular item into production? So we ticket everything. And part of the promotion is literally a ticket from the manager to say, we're happy with version 1.2, push it into prod. And an easy way to achieve that is to do uh, something like this. And Harbor has decided log me out just a moment while I log in so as you can see in our DTR or I keep calling it a DTR because that's what docker called their own version effectively a docker registry we have a staging and a prod directory everything we build goes into staging things that then get promoted go into prod and you can only run things in prod that are in prod if it's a daft statement but I kind of assume you do catch my drift and that Good grief, still isn't enough waffle for this thing to complete. I must apologize. I really didn't expect it to take quite this long when I ran it um, on my system before. Um, but basically, the, the general idea, what I'm going to end up with here, and I haven't even got to the labeling section, so unfortunately, I can't even show you that yet. We're going to end up with a Docker image that is tagged with uh, a local tag. Now, there's several ways you can manage that, but basically what we achieve by tagging it with a local tag in this particular case is that you can't push it. You can't accidentally decide, okay, well, this is good enough. I'll push it up to our Docker registry so we can use it somewhere because our Docker registry will reject things that are tagged local uh, for the simple reason that we don't have a project called local. So there's, there's no way for it to go. So that's one way to accomplish it. When I push this into CICD, I instruct my Docker build tool to instead tag it with a staging build, which can go into um, our uh, Docker registry so that we make sure that all the containers we use are not coming off people's hard drives. We don't know necessarily what they've got installed or don't have installed or what labels they might have set at the container or indeed for that matter, if somebody accidentally took an ancient version um, that they built three weeks ago and tagged it latest and pushed it accidentally, which could happen. We're now running um, the wrong thing in staging and production. To avoid any of that kind of thing, uh, CICD tooling is one of the most, I don't want to say difficult, but it is one of the areas where this kind of thing is most useful because in, unless you're using it every day, which as the DevOps engineers you probably are, as the other developers you probably aren't, you expect the CICD tooling to just work. You plug into it, you sit down, you write something, you you send it to your CICD build and away it goes. It's, it can be difficult to make it, to get it right, um, to make it either pass or to make it at least do the right thing. So one of the major advantages of this kind of foundation laying is to make the CI CD work without anybody having to worry about it. They know when they ran cookie cutter, they ended up with a tool that can be built and away it goes and it does its building. In this particular case, just to point out um, the Docker build tool. Also, I have decided my fictional company wants labels in each Docker container, I want the timestamp, which is literally the time as it was the, when we kicked off the building. I want the version, and I want the hash of the Git commit that we're sitting in right now, which is effectively the head of Git as we stand now. 
and I want to know where I got it from in Git. This is perhaps not particularly useful information, um, it, but it, you'd be surprised how useful it is to have that kind of audit trail information available to you when you later need to figure out where exactly did this come from. If it's labeled into your container, that's yet another way you can go and get the information. But most people, if they're just building this themselves, it kind of as a side project, are not going to necessarily think to go and make those labels. And um, I was going to run that container, and I have completely lost track of the line that I had for running it. So you're going to have to watch me type fresh things, which is always scary. That's not going to work. Sorry about that. That's not going to work at all because uh, it's not on the right network. If I could just comment, Simon is pointing out not useful 99% of the time. Uh, Lifesaver, the other percent, dead right. It's exactly like having debugging on in, in your logs. You don't need the debug until it's too late to go back and turn it on. Similarly, you don't need this kind of hash information. You don't need to know the exact repo uh, tag that you built this piece of information, this piece of software that somehow found its way into prod. You don't need to know where that came from uh, until that absolute one time when that is the only way to track down where the bug came from. So these kind of data, for the most part, sits unused. But once you do need it, you'll be very glad you did it. In this case, I've run my little Docker tool. Um, the reason it didn't run first time is I didn't tell it to use my host network. And because this is fudged together on my laptop, um, dtr.local is a host entry on my laptop. So unless the Docker container's got the same host entry, it's never going to find it. Basically, it ran and it did the right thing. And I just want to basically show that I can't push it. OK, I've tried to push it to my DTR. I, my DTR said, I don't know anything about local. Go away. There are probably smarter ways you could do that, but this is one way to to stop it doing it. I'm just quickly, while I give some um, waffle, going to commit it to my GitLab. And what we've got out of that, sorry, that's the slide. That's not what I want. This is what we want. We are now running a pipeline. So my CI CD is kicked off. All my CI CD is doing, and I'll just show you basically exactly that. And in this particular case, we're in the master branch. So we've logged into our DTR. Again, ultra secure, if username and password are directly in each CI CD file, because certainly, why wouldn't they be? What could be less dangerous than that? And Docker build has been executed and told to use the staging project. That's all it's doing. And all the difference is that once it builds it exactly like it did it for us locally, it's going to push it into our registry as well. And that's going to take a little bit of while to run. So I'm going to move on and just give a little bit more uh, discussion before we get back to it. The promotion tool I think I've spoken about. I won't necessarily um, show what I'm talking about in terms of how it works. But there is one other important thing. And just keeping an eye on the time, I see um, if I'm going by the length of time this recording has been going, it's been 37 minutes. So I'd guess it would be about 10 minutes or so to go um, that I can use, which I don't necessarily need all of. But I see uh, Simon is typing. OK, 10 minutes to go. So I'm bang on time. The final thing that I just wanted to point out, and again, I, I, I mentioned this because it's, it's not obvious how would one how one would solve this problem and certainly this solution I've gone for I this I left this idea directly from SA Homeland so the solution SA Homeland has gone for is one that definitely works in terms of version info I was mentioning earlier you could keep your version info in etcd or some similar external key value tool some database or uh, anything that will keep some data for you persistent over connections and presumably living, living on a central machine rather than somebody's laptop but an etcd is the example I happen to use. So I'm just basically quickly going to leave um, my DTR image example alone for a moment. And I'm going to run another cookie cutter. Uh, 
which I had not got a copy of. Um, Basically, I'm going to run a, whoops, sorry. I've got two cookie cutter templates on my system. I've got one for Python projects and I've got one for bash projects. Our bash projects are considerably simpler. This is going to be the world's simplest piece of bash. Um, I'm just running it to show an example. Yes, you can go with me, oops. Um, more or less the same questions as last time. A much simpler uh, cookie cutter template. There's no Python involved. There's no um, PyProject.toml. There's no uh, Python files and so forth. What we end up with in here is effectively some Git stuff, um, a single bash script, which currently does absolutely nothing, the readmes and so forth that we had before, and the same Docker build. Um, and basically, in order for this to do something useful, I'm just going to put some code into it. So, incredibly complex, massively useful bash script here. So if I execute my bash script, it literally says hello. Well then, hi. The reason I did that is that I just wanted to demonstrate one of the useful other things you can get from etcd. My etcd contains in it a version for um, uh, this greeting tool. It happens to be 0 0.5. Clearly, I've done, I've run this at least four times before in preparation. So it went to my etcd, found I had a version for greeting, read as it was 0 0.5, bumped it to 0 0.6, and it's now building me version 0 0.6. If I run it again, which I can happily do when this is done, it should not take very long to do this. Um, it will then go figure out, well, 0.6 is an etcd. I'd best make 0.7 and repeat, etc. which is a useful way to keep track of versions across different systems. Our build tool will do exactly the same thing. If I committed this to the build system, it would go and get from etcd whatever the most recent version was build it and upload it. There are slight downsides to that particularly simplistic approach that I've taken, given that if I ran this build, so yeah, we've, we've put version 0.6 into etcd, and we've built and tagged it with 0.6. If I run this again and again and again, it's now gone to etcd, got 0.6, it's going to build 0.7 and repeat. Obviously, if I then tell my CICD to use this, it'll go and build 0.8, where you probably want your CICD to be building something like 0.1. Uh, that's a really a question of just not being smart enough in the tooling that I've written for this demonstration. But the point remains that the general idea is there that this is a kind of a useful way you could go about doing this. And while it has done that, I'm just going to quickly come back to Gloria. Are you still running? OK. Um, I don't know why. When I did this testing previously, because obviously there's a distinct difference between testing things and showing them in production, it took much longer in production, or rather during the actual presentation, than it did when I ran it in testing. But I'm basically going to, if I have the time, come back and show you that this worked. But otherwise, go to my last slide and just point out a couple of useful things that are maybe worth considering. Lessons we've learned, and I say not during the implementation of this talk, during implementation of this at SA Home Loans or various other places. For people who only do this from time to time, and that is most of your developers, most people aren't using um, the under the hood CICD tooling and so forth every day. You do need to tell people about them again and again. Um, so you need to tell them that these things exist. You need to remind them that uh, this tooling is available. If you see somebody, particularly happens a lot, um, if you keep an eye on chickens to your, your uh, Git or whatever your version control is, and you see files that arrive that haven't followed these processes, it's worth it, although it can be a bit awkward, to wander over to the developer in question and tell them, by the way, did you know that this tooling existed? Because most people don't know. Um, anything that makes your fellow developer's life easier, they're more than happy to use, but they'll only use it if they know it exists. The other kind of useful thing to point out, and this is again a, a lesson from somewhat bitter experience, your things like cookie cutter templates, questions that the user gets asked to set up projects, the simpler the better, basically. Your 
I asked maybe six questions, you know, author, email address, etc. A lot of that kind of thing with a smarter tool could be picked from the system. Um, so, for example, our SO Home Loan tooling doesn't ask you about the user's name. It doesn't ask you about the user's email address. It doesn't actually ask you even about um, what you want the project to be called. We just assume those things. We, we pick up the user from the local user. We pick up the email address from Active Directory for the local user, and we pick up what the project is called by taking the name you gave it and applying a set of unbreakable rules. That kind of thing is useful um, because the fewer questions you need to ask, the easier it is to get right. The more people will actually go ahead and use the tooling. And the fancier it gets, the more complicated logic there is in it, the more you need to decide whether you're making a Python project or a Bath project or a um, or any other kind of thing. It can be tempting to do that as one global make everything type template. So basically, everyone says, I want a new project. And then you get asked 15 different questions about what you want. By the time you get down that road, and I only say this out of experience because I've been down this road, it is far better to be simpler, have 15, <laughs> maybe not 15, but have two or three different options. Uh, Simon, sorry, was that the you're on a time bell, or was that a cup of tea you were putting down on the? Oh, sorry, that was something on my table was just made a noise. Oh. Oh, fair enough. I, I just know last year there was a kind of gentle signal. I wondered if that was your gentle signal to say shut up and stop talking. Um, uh, no, no. Uh, please fin finish up. Well, well, I was effectively finishing up. Uh, I was, okay. Yeah. Well, no. I will. I will. Do a couple more words. Basically, just yeah. As I say, it, it can be tempting to be too fancy. Simple is good in this case. I know simple is good makes it seem you know we don't want to be simple. Simple makes it seem like you don't work hard enough. But the simpler, the better is what you're after in situations like this. And finally, I'm just going to finish on um, going back to my git.local. You'll see it did build. It did um, pick up from PyTOML. It tagged it as, uh, so I have to scroll a little bit to see what we ended up with. Yeah, dtr.local slash staging slash dtr image reporter. Because it's in staging, it pushed. In fact, these are the results of the pushing. So if I go to my registry, I open up staging, and voila, we have a new project called the Detail Image Reporter, which is tagged as both latest and 0.1, which my Docker build tool linked it. I could now promote this to prod because it's in staging, and I could happily go forth and use it in prod, um, and all the while be fairly confident that all my tooling has been followed, all the rules I need are in place, and everything I would need my Docker containers to have is in place because we followed some simple well, no, not simple, because we followed some templated stuff without having to expect people to get it right every time by hand. And that is it. Great. Um, well, th thank you, uh, thank you, Kim. Um, I mean, De DevOps as a as a developer, I, I really, really appreciate um, the things that kind of DevOps build. Um, I see there's one last question um, actually about your bash prompt from from Cleary. Yes, I'd love to have a quick answer for you there, Claire. I basically installed that about two and a half years ago. I would have to go and hunt my system to figure out exactly what it is I did. It is, as you as you suspected, um, basically hooked into the, the local Git. If I leave that directory, I don't get it anymore. Um, I'll figure out what it is and uh, drop a line somewhere in Discord. Um, oh, awesome. Um... And I'm going to steal presentation again so that I can play Kim some applause. Cool. Um, we have a, a 15 minute, or actually a 13 minute break now before uh, uh, David's talk on uh, Bytes of Pi. Um, this room will stay open and David's talk will be here. Um, so, but feel free to change rooms if you need to. Um, the talk happening in the other room will be on high bandwidth HTTP, down, HTTP downloads um, by Bruce Murray. Um, and that should also be using the same link as the previous session, as the previous talk in video room two. Um, cool. So thank you uh, again, Kim, for uh, a great talk. And 
Um, I really appreciated the emphasis on keeping things simple. It's very easy for, uh, from a developer point of view, for these kind of DevOps tools to become kind of very complicated. Um, and kind of, as you say, that's, that's a, a big challenge for people who are not working with them every day. Yeah, well, exactly. It's a, it's a challenge for the developer to then use the tooling, but it's a challenge for us, the DevOps people, to keep it simple. Because, you know, if you use it every day, there's so many better things you could do if you just added a couple of extra questions. And, you know, yes, exactly. It was the, the exactly lure of, of making things fancier. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you again. And see everyone, well, who's uh, coming for David's talk here in uh, 12 minutes.